Now, if you go to the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and he speaks about the munafiqeen. Ayah number 56, وَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُمْ لَمِنْكُمْ وَمَا هُمْ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ يَفْرَقُونَ And they swear by God, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, that truly they are of you, but they are not of you. Rather, they are fearful people. Now you see when we speak about the hypocrites, the munafiqeen, there's a theme that is emerging. And that is that there is no authenticity between what they say and what they do. They're constantly overcompensating. They make these false oaths saying that we are with you, but they're not actually with you. Their hearts are against you. And this is one of the signs of the munafiq, is that what is in their, what's on their tongues is not what is in their hearts. What they do in private is not reflected in how they conduct themselves in public. When they are among themselves, they are, they conduct themselves in a certain way. And when they're in public, they have a different mannerism. There's no authenticity between their public life and their private life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Because they live this double life. They live this double life. They're always in a state of fear. Now the word farq means to separate. But here it means that they're fearful because the Arabs, you know, when someone is so afraid, we say that, especially in Arabic, we say that his soul is going to be separated from his body because of the intensity of the fear. So when Allah says, وَلَكِنَّهُمْ وَلَكِنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ يَفْرَقُونَ يَفْرَقُونَ here means that they are fearful. What are they fearful of? Number one, they are afraid of being exposed. Because as I said, their, their private life is totally different from their public life. They're afraid of being exposed. Remember, they're pretending to be believers, but they're not actually believers. So this fear of being exposed, they're also afraid, they're in the state of perpetual fear of being exposed. They're also afraid of joining the Prophet on his military expeditions. They're afraid to fight alongside the Prophet. Because in many cases, those who are on, on the other side of the battlefield, the enemies of, of the Prophet are actually their friends. So they're afraid of killing their comrades, who are the kuffar. And they're also afraid of death. They're afraid of dying. So they have all of these fears that occupy their heart. Fear of being exposed. Fear of fighting alongside the Prophet and killing one of their friends. Fear of being killed. So they live in this constant state of fear. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 57, He describes the extent of their fear. So Allah says, They're fearful people. How fearful are they? Allah explains. Allah says, were they to find a refuge? or caves, or a place to enter, they were turned toward it defiantly. Now the word melja means a refuge. That's why in Arabic we call a refugee lajit. Lajit. Magharat is the plural of ghar. So you know ghar hira. Magharat is the plural of cave, caves. And then muddakhalan, Mudakhalan here is translated as a place to enter. Now the Mufassirin have said that this could mean, you know, an underground place, you know, a labyrinth that they would hide in. So 
if they had the opportunity, these munafiqeen, if they had another option, a way out, they would seek refuge in the mountains, in the caves, and even inside of the earth. If they had, if they were to find a refuge or caves or a place to enter, they would turn towards it. Now, yajmahun is an interesting word that's being used because the word yajmahun is from the word al-jimah. And it was a word that was used to describe a horse that would frantically run away at high speeds. So yajmahun is a verb that describes a horse, a very fast horse that would run, run away frantically. Now, what do we learn from this ayah, brothers and sisters? So in ayah number 56, the munafiqeen were expressing their solidarity with the Prophet, that we're with you. But here Allah is reminding us that not everyone who expresses solidarity with you is sincere. And I think this is a very important for us to learn, especially if we want to be political activists. You know, as Muslims, you know, many times we're approached by politicians. And politicians will say things like, we stand with the Muslim community, that they, they run a campaign and they position themselves as friends of the Muslim community, as those who express solidarity with the Muslim community. Now, mu'mineen should not be naive because many of these politicians, many of them, if, if they had another option, they would abandon us. If they had a refuge, they would abandon us. Meaning that many of them express solidarity because they want your vote. There's no sincerity in there. They want... They want your votes or they want your money, their, your financial support. So we shouldn't take things at face value. And that's why it's very unfortunate that you know Mus many Muslims are very naive today. The moment any politician says Eid Mubarak or Ramadan Mubarak to the Muslims, they say, oh, look at this guy. He's, he's a great friend of the Muslim community. Allah says, don't be, don't be naive. Don't be simple-minded. Because in the same way the munafiqeen, they express solidarity with the Prophet. If they had an opportunity to turn their backs, they would. And that's why you see the moment they get in office, there's no more solidarity. And they pander to who? To those who back them. To those who financially back them. The moment they have a refuge or a cave, and of course these are symbolic. The moment they find someone else who serves their interests, they'll abandon you. So this is an, an important ayah to guide our political activism, that we should not just listen to rhetoric and not be swayed by rhetoric. We need to look deeply at policies and someone's track record. We need to see what they say in public and what they say when they're you know, in front of the camera. Muslims shouldn't be naive. And then in ayah number nine, in ayah number 58, Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَلْمِزُكَ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ فَإِنْ أُعْطُوا مِنْهَا رَضُوا وَإِنْ لَمْ يُعْطَوْ مِنْهَا إِذَا هُمْ يَسْخَطُونَ Allah says, and among them, some reproach you over the charitable offerings. If they are given from it, they are content. But if they are not given, behold, they are angry. Now, this ayah is, is interesting because it was revealed about a specific incident that took place during the time of the Prophet. It is reported that after one of the battles, you know, brothers and sisters, after the battles, especially if the Muslims were victorious, you know, the Muslims have spoils of war, and the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ would distribute the spoils of war, the ghana'an. On one occasion, the Prophet was distributing wealth, the money, the anfal, 
to the Muslim fighters. And a man from Banu Tamim, he comes to the Prophet. The narrations say that he had a very long beard. He was, you know, among the Bedouin Arabs. And he says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah I'dil. O Prophet, O Messenger of God, be just. Meaning, he was discontent. He was displeased with the way that the Prophet was distributing wealth. He's basically saying the Prophet to the Prophet, be just. You're not being fair. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Waylak, woe be to you. Man ya'adil idha lam a'adil. Who is just if I'm not just? The narration says that Umar ibn al-Khattab says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, do you give me permission to cut his head off? Allahu Akbar. The Prophet says to him, no, leave him. You know, some, some of our Sunni brothers and sisters, when they read these ahadith, they say, look, look at how much, how much Umar ibn al-Khattab loved the Prophet. He's willing to take out his sword and kill. This is not a sign of iman, that any time there's an, a disagreement, any time someone says anything, that you want to cut someone's head off. The Prophet tells him, da'hu, leave him. فَإِنَّ لَهُ and I want you to listen to this verse because it will shed light even on what's happening in modern times. So this man insults the Prophet. He says, Oh Muhammad, be just. And it creates some commotion among the companions. The Prophet says, some of the companions wanted to kill him. The Prophet says, leave him. فَإِنَّ لَهُ أَصْحَابًا يَحْتَقِرُ أَحَدُكُمْ صَلَاتَهُ مَعَ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ Leave him because him and his companions, they pray in such a way that if you were to see their salah, you would belittle your own prayer. And if you were to see how much they fast, you would belittle your fasting. But they will depart faith in the same way that an arrow leaves the bow. These people, brothers and sisters, are what we would call today ISIS. You know ISIS? This is ancient, the ancient form of ISIS. People who are very ritualistic, they appear to be religious, they're zealots, they're fanatics. They think they're holier than the Prophet. This man is trying to teach Rasulullah. And the Prophet is saying that leave him. Because this individual and his companions, their prayer and their fasting outwardly will seem superior to yours. But they are the furthest from faith. And interestingly, this same man who accuses the Prophet of being unjust in the way that he distributes wealth among his companions this man later becomes one of the khawarij and is killed by ali ibn abi talib in the battle of nahrawan so you find that you know taliban al-qaeda isis whatever these groups are these religious fanatics believe me they existed at the time of the prophet rasulullah even says that if you were to see their prayers you would belittle your own prayers but they are the furthest from faith. And indeed, you see these individuals emerging generation after generation. So his criteria, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if they are given from it, they are content. But if they are not given from it, behold, they are angry. So this individual from Banu Tamim who was telling the Prophet to be just, justice in his eyes is what? It's based on self-interest. We have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, is our sense of justice based on our own interests? You know, if, if there is a demonstration, you know, for Black Lives Matter, do we participate or do we say that I have nothing to gain? And some of us were very opportunistic. 
We're very self-centered when it comes to even our activism, our political and social activism. We only participate in social justice movements if we feel that we are direct beneficiaries. But if we're not, we don't participate because our, our concept of justice is based on self-interest. And Allah Azza wa Jal rebukes this. And then in ayah number 59, Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ رَضُوا مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ سَيُؤْتِينَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَرَسُولُهُ إِنَّا إِلَى اللَّهِ رَاغِبُونَ If only they had been content with what God and His Messenger gave them and said, God suffices us. God will give us from His bounty as will his messenger. Truly our desire is for God. Now it's interesting in this verse, Allah tells us, tells the believers that be content with whatever Allah has given you and whatever the Prophet gives you. Everything that they do, there's wisdom in it. Don't protest and know that God will. Say, Allahu min fadli. God will give you from his fadl, from his bounty. Fadl here means that God will give you that which is even beyond what you deserve. And notice that when Allah speaks about giving from His bounty, He says that you will be given from my bounty and also the Prophet will give you. And Muslim theologians, Muslim philosophers, they marvel at this ayah because here you would think that Fadl only comes from Allah. But the ayah says that God will give us from his bounty as will his messenger. Meaning in dunya and in akhirah, divine bounty is given to us from God through the medium of Rasulullah. Every ni'mah that you receive, whether it's food, health, your existence itself, is a fadl of Allah. But the only reason why it's given to you is that it's given to you through the medium of the Prophet. All of the divine blessings that reach you have to first go through the Messenger and then they reach you. So this is why Muslim philosophers, they say that the Prophet is wasitatul fayl that we are not in an existential position to receive God's bounty directly. We have to receive it in a way that's filtered through the Holy Prophet because he is the most sublime created being and therefore he is wasatatul fayl. All divine grace reaches us through the Holy Prophet in dunya and in akhir. And that's why the Prophet is the first thing that Allah created. The first thing that God created is the light of Muhammad Because even the gift of existence has to flow through him. Now, a question that may come to mind is that the Prophet is accumulating all of this wealth, you know, in the battlefields, you know, munafiqeen are offering their money to him. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you know, he's the head of state. He's established a government. There's Baytul Mal. Now, people may ask, what does the Prophet do with all of this wealth that he has amassed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the next ayah, he answers this question. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَالْغَارِمِينَ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ فَرِيضَةً مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ The charitable offerings are only for the poor and the destitute and those working with them and those whose hearts are inclined and for ransoming slaves and for debtors and in the way of God 
and for the traveler, a duty from God, and God is all-knowing and all-wise. Now here, the ayah is speaking about the distribution of zakat. Now, even though the ayah says, innama sadaqat, you know, in the Quran, there are two terms that are used. Sadaqat, sadaqa, and zakat. The word sadaqa generally refers to voluntary charity. Zakat is what refers to, generally it refers to mandatory alms. But in some cases, sadaqat is used to refer to mandatory alms. And here, even though Allah uses the word sadaqat, it's in reference to the obligatory zakat. And zakat, in our ju jurisprudence, it's on certain items, certain cattle, certain crops, and on gold and silver that are used as uh, currency. Now, in this ayah, Allah is speaking about those who are to receive Zakat, so the beneficiaries of the zakat system. Allah mentions eight groups of people, eight groups who are deserving, eight places where zakat is to be spent. The first is innama sadaqatu lil fuqara'i wal masakin. So, number one is faqir, the poor, number two is miskeen, the destitute, number three is wal amirina alayha. You know, those who collect the zakat, the tax collectors, and those who distribute the zakat to those who are in need. So, so those who administer this Islamic tax. Those whose hearts are inclined, and I'll speak about this. Slaves, those who are in debt, those and, and uh, spent in the way of God, and for the traveler. Now we take the first, faqir and miskeen. Now, what is the difference between faqir and miskeen? Now, in many cases, if the word miskeen or faqir is used alone, they're synonymous. But when they're mentioned in the same ayah, when they're mentioned side by side, there is a distinction. There's a hadith where Muhammad ibn Muslim, one of the students of our fifth and sixth imam, he asks either Imam al-Sadiq or Imam al-Baqir, one of them, the fifth or the sixth Imam, about the difference between a faqir and a miskeen. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, al-faqir la yas'al. He says, a faqir is someone who's poor, but they don't beg. You know, it hasn't reached a point where they're utterly penniless and they're out in the streets begging. You know, some people are fuqara, but you might not know. They don't beg. But they don't have enough to cover their expenses. So the miskeen is the one who is even worse. Who is so poor that they're begging. They don't even have enough to fulfill their needs and their expenses for the day. These two are... Our, uh, they are recipients of zakat. These deserve zakat. Now zakat, you may ask, when was zakat mandated? Zakat was actually instituted during the Meccan period, before the hijrah. Now zakat was legislated in Mecca, but people were, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it to the believers to pay zakat to those who felt, who they felt were deserving of it. So zakat, the collection and the distribution of zakat was handled by the individual. After the hijrah, when the prophet arrives in Medina, in the first couple of years, he establishes Baytul Man, the Islamic treasury, because now there is a government that has been established. And in this same surah, in Surah at tawbah in ayah number 103, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِرَهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ Take the zakat from them. Which means now, 
Allah is placing the responsibility of collecting zakat upon the Prophet and now it is the responsibility of the Prophet to distribute zakat. So in the Meccan period, people were given the freedom to distribute zakat in the way that they saw fit. But now zakat must be collected and distributed by the Prophet. Khud, take it from them. They don't have a right to withhold it. You go and you take it from them. Now, as mentioned in the ayah, so the poor and the destitute are recipients of zakat. عَلَيْهَا Now there's a government. There are certain companions who have been appointed by the Prophet to collect this Islamic tax, this religious due, and also to distribute it to its beneficiaries. So these are government employees now. Zakat, a portion of the zakat is given to cover the salaries of those who administer this uh, zakat, the tax. Among those who receive zakat, who can receive zakat, are those whose hearts are inclined. You know, those who maybe just became Muslim and they're still on the fence, you give them money to show that you're to show them that you're a part of this ummah, we care for you. So so they have this affinity towards the Muslim community. It can also be given to non-Muslims, you know, to win their hearts is so they don't align themselves with the enemies of Islam. You know, if they see that the Muslims are caring for them, you know, if Jews and Christians and other non-Muslims are being given you know, some financial support, maybe perhaps it will prompt them to learn about Islam. So the idea here is not to, to buy people, to bribe people into becoming Muslim, but to create an environment where they would be interested in learning more about Islam, or at the very least, not supporting the enemies of Islam. A portion of the zakat, a portion of Baytul Mal, is also allotted to free people from slavery. So the Prophet, as the head of the Islamic State, he would go around and he would approach slave owners. Would you like to sell your slave? And if, if the price is right, Rasulullah gives it to them and he frees them. So part of the zakat is actually to emancipate slaves in medina wal gharimin and those who have debt imagine what what a wonderful government that you have a government established by the prophet that helps people who are in debt who who, are, who have legitimate debts not someone who goes and buys a ferrari and he's in debt no we're talking about you know someone for example whose car broke down and he's in debt and he can't and he he buys a car and he's in debt or someone's house burns down and they're in debt because of you know a valid reason a portion of the zakat is there to relieve people from debt especially if they're in debt just to cover some of their basic necessities and for the sake of god anything that is pleasing to god can also be used as zakat and those who are traveling you know someone who's traveling may not have access, especially at that time, you know, they didn't have access to their wealth, they're traveling, they run out of funds, they don't have enough money to support themselves. The Islamic State would provide a stipend for those who are traveling and didn't have the means to return to their families or support themselves. And then I'll end with this hadith as we're approaching the end of our session. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi, and this is something to really reflect on. It's, it's food for thought, especially in, in this time. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ النَّاسَ أَدَّوا أَدَّوا زَكَاتَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ The Imam says, if people, if the Muslims paid their religious dues, if they paid their zakat, if they paid their khums, if all Muslims paid, imagine 1.5 billion Muslims. Forget about 1.5 billion. If all of the Shias, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, paid their zakat and their khums, 
The Imam alayhi salam says, ma baqiya muslimun faqeeran muhtajan. There would not be a single Muslim who would be in need. وَإِنَّ النَّاسَ مَفْتَقَرُوا وَلَا احْتَاجُوا وَلَا جَاعُوا وَلَا عَرَوْا إِلَّا بِذْنُوبِ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ And Imam al-Sadiq, he says, as a general rule of thumb, the only reason why people go hungry and people starve and they're in need and they don't have clothes, they don't have basic necessities, the only reason why people live in poverty around the world, it's because of the sins of the wealthy. Meaning, the problem is not that the earth has limited resources and there's not the earth doesn't produce enough food to feed the people. That's not the problem. The problem, world hunger doesn't exist because there's a shortage of resources. Imam al-Sadiq says the problem is what? Unfair distribution. That wealth is concentrated with certain individuals, certain institutions, certain countries, and other people are neglected. If everybody paid their religious dues, we would eliminate poverty. You would eliminate world hunger at the very least. But people, they don't understand that Islam is much more than doing your daily prayers and fasting and reciting Quran. Islam is about establishing social justice, establishing a world where everyone has their basic needs met because how can you teach people about the purification of the soul if they're starving allah in the quran says allah says and let them worship the lord of this house of the kaaba why should they worship him because he 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 fed you he secured your economic welfare and he provided security. If you take away, if, if, if people are not economically stable and there's no security, you there's no environment for them to develop their spirituality. That's why there's such a great emphasis on zakat and khums and the distribution of wealth in society. So we can create an atmosphere, a society, where people can nurture their God consciousness. But the problem is people are just struggling to survive. How can you develop the spirituality of people who are just barely surviving? You have to meet their basic needs and then you've created an environment, an atmosphere where they can truly develop their relationship with Allah. We ask Allah Azza wa to bless us and guide us and inspire our hearts with the teachings of with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahirin any questions or comments so how do you there are many different opportunities to uh, establish justice stand up for truth uh, or go to protest or whatever how, how do you uh, prioritize what to go for? You know, the way that you prioritize is that, you know, what are the issues that are affecting most people around the world? You know, what, what are the issues that are having a direct impact on, on your community? Now, there are many noble causes to participate in. You know, for example, you know, to advocate for uh, you know, you know, better treatment of the environment, you know, to speak about climate change, for example, is a noble cause. But does it have the same urgency as, for example, the crisis in Yemen? Probably not. So I think that I think really it, it comes down to common sense. You know, you know, what issues are truly affecting the greater a greater amount of people? You know, what, what are the issues that are really life and death? You know, I would say Yemen is definitely something that, that should take, uh, you know, priority. In our own communities, you know, people who don't have food, just look at the basic necessities. You know, drinkable water. You know, it's sad that we live in the year 2018 and there are still people in the world who don't have access to clean water. That's a priority. 
people who don't have food to eat. That's a priority. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, you just focus on one issue and don't, don't even think about anything else. You know, you can dedicate a little bit of time to each of these issues, but, you know, I would create a list of maybe two or three issues that, you know, you would be much more involved in, you know. Uh, so it really depends on the, the circumstances. You have to really examine the world that you live in and determine, you know, what are the most basic human needs and where are those human needs not being fulfilled in the world? And I and I think, as I mentioned, I think that that the, in the year 2018, the greatest humanitarian crisis is what's happening in Yemen. And and the crisis in Yemen is connected to so many other political issues. You know, what's happening in Yemen is also it it goes back to so you have a problem with access to drinkable water, poverty. And it's also related to, you know, the, the military industrial complex. It's also related to Zionism. So there are so many things that are connected to this one issue. You know, Yemen is like a web. And there are so many uh, issues that are connected to it. And I think it, it requires, uh, you know, someone who's, uh, who's very politically savvy, someone who's sharp to kind of, you know, unpack everything that's happening and everything that's related to the uh to the crisis uh in the end and, and and just to add to that it, you know sometimes there are certain issues that are of great importance but i might i might not have the skill set to be an effective participant so i think that it's a combination of identifying you know what are the, where are the problem areas and really take an honest look at your own skill set and ask yourself can i make a valuable contribution to this to this movement or do i have a skill set that i can i can you know part i can be more effective you know when it comes to this this specific issue and uh and Inshallah, why is it significant that the Quran says that we receive bounties from both Allah and from the Prophet? Why is it significant? Yes. You know, th th this, is, this is one of the instances in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to highlight the supreme spiritual station of the Prophet. Because, you know, as you know, there are some sects within Islam that consider the prophet as just a mailman the prophet is there just to hand us the quran and that's it his role is finished some of us we don't understand the role the messenger plays in in the in, in the world in the creation of god rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi is the he is the centerpiece of allah's creation He's not just the messenger of God who delivers a message and then his job is finished. Rasulullah is the heart of creation. And Allah, when he says that, that if you go to the ayah that you mentioned, say you Allahu min fadli, that God will give us from his bounty as will his messenger. It's to highlight that the Prophet ﷺ, you don't only need him in this life for guidance. You need him to come into existence. And you need him to even receive the blessings of Jannah. That fadl, this bounty, comes from God. Now there's no denying, this is not shirk. It's all from Allah. But we are not able to receive it directly from God. You know, in the same way that, you know, when you plug in, you know, any device into the outlet, you have to pay attention to the voltage, right? Otherwise, it's going to damage, you know, the phone or the computer, especially when you go overseas, right? Why? Because it can't handle that, that amount of current. Similarly, we cannot handle that that type of exposure because our souls are not refined enough to receive fadl directly from god 
but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you know, Faden, as we, we spoke about this in Surah al Najm when he covered it, he has reached a state of divine proximity whereby everything, everything flows through him. Mm. Everything flows through him. He's the reason why Allah created Adam, Ibrahim, all, everybody is from the Prophet. And then, you know, when you go to the hadith of the Prophet, the first thing that God created was my light. And then from this light, it was split into two. And then it was split into the light of the Prophet and the light of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this also allows us to understand the rank of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that he's the nafs of the Prophet. You know, this is why when you read Nahjul Balagh, and maybe read it tonight or tomorrow, if you look at the first sermon of Nahjul Balagha, Amir al Mu'mineen is describing the creation of the universe not as someone who is being told, it's as though he's witnessing it. And we believe that the arwah of the Prophet, the anwar of Ahlul Bayt, predated the physical creation of the universe. So, this, so when Allah says that, that he will give you from his bounty as will his messenger. It's it's a subtle uh, way of highlighting the supreme spiritual station of the Prophet as the medium of divine grace. Just to add to this, uh, Shaykh, uh, the hadith from Hadith al Qudsi, Law lak wa ma khalaqtu la flak. Yes. Uh, yeah. you know, it wasn't I would not have created nothing if I would not have created you, O Muhammad. No. Yeah, just yeah, just to add. Of course, you know better than me. And and if it were, and if it was not for Ali, he would not have created the Prophet. Now, someone may say, "Isn't this blasphemy?" No, it's not blasphemy, because the Prophet's efforts would be in vain if it was not for the fact that Ali ibn Abi Talib is safeguarding and protecting the message. And if it was not for Fatima, he would have he would have he would have, he would have never created either of them, because Fatima is. You know the link between Nubuwa and Imama, and she played a pivotal role in exposing the human idols that emerged after the death of the Prophet. You know, I was I mentioned this in one of uh, my majalis that Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam, when he conquered when the Prophet and when the Prophet conquered Mecca, Amir al Mu'minin stood on the shoulders of the Prophet and he destroyed. The idols in the Kaaba. He destroyed the idols made out of stone and other things. But Fatima to Zahra destroyed the human idols after the death after the death of the Prophet by simply concealing the location of her grave. And therefore, no one can say that the first Khalifa and the second Khalifa, you know, they had a good relationship with Fatima to Zahra. She completely shook the foundation of their government she def she defied the legitimacy of their government so she really you know becomes the uh that beacon of light that allows us to distinguish between haq and batin you know sometimes it becomes vague but with yes. fatima to zahra she she definitely made it very clear thank you Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Please keep me in your du'a, inshallah. I have a question about the Qums also, right? This the ayat which is explained. Oh, um. uh, Sheikh, sorry, there's one more question. I think I have too many questions for you today. Okay. Um, the last ayat, ayat 60, uh, mentions about the work and the workers. Walmasakini walamilina alayha. Yes. So these, what workers are these and who are they? Uh, do they have some percentage, some cut off uh, when they are distributing the zakat or homes? Now, well, Amelina Aleha, as I mentioned, they're essentially government employees. They would be appointed by the Prophet and they're, they would be tax collectors. And this would take a considerable amount of time, especially considering that, you know, the Muslims didn't only reside in Medina. There were Muslims in parts of Yemen and other parts of the Arabian Peninsula. So to go from house to house and collect these funds, bring them back, count them, and then distribute them 
to the uh, to those who are deserving, those who fall in, into the, the categories that we mentioned, I would imagine that this would be a, a full time job, you know, and you know it might come as a surprise, but you know even Abu Sufyan was appointed by the Prophet as one of the uh, the tax collectors, you know, because he, you know, so this shows you that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sometimes appointed people, even even if they weren't mu'minin, but they were good at what they did. They were, you know, they had the skill set. He was good with money, and perhaps the Prophet wanted to make him feel important, you know, because he was one of the elites during Zaman al Jahiliyyah. So to give him some position and to make his heart more inclined, Rasulullah appointed him as one of the uh, tax collectors. So uh, this was, uh, you know, they had to make a living. So because this would occupy a lot of their time, the Prophet assigned them wages from Baytul Mal. Okay. Thank you, Shaykh. Jazakumullah Inshallah, we will continue our discussion uh, next week. I hope it wasn't too lengthy today. Yeah. Inshallah, this was uh, excellent. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you. Keep me in your dua, Inshallah.